Welcome to another episode. For this one, it would be helpful if you had a chance to listen to episodes 9 and 9.1. I think they're entitled, So Your Ex Has Stopped You Seeing Your Kids. I've alluded to some of the things that we cover in this episode, but this guest is open to helping you with any issues around child contact. It's not an incredibly long episode, but there are definitely things in it that you should probably really think about. So strap in and hope you find this episode useful too. to this point because anyone does this it's for a reason and it's generally not because you sort of what at the age of four you decided actually this is what i want to do yeah 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 well often often you don't really i i I suppose most people wouldn't really understand unless they've been through it and if they don't understand because they haven't been through it then it would just pass them by but you see more and more people actually go through it and actually willing to speak up about it now which is I think a lot of people just suffered in silence before. Yeah. And I think now maybe with social media, people are able to speak a bit, a little bit more about it. There's a little bit less of a stigma because it happens to so many, so many men now, um, in particular separation, you know, with children. So mm. um, what was really interesting when I, um, when I first separated from my ex-partner, um, you know, I, I, I'd been a member of like football clubs and also I've had loads of mates and stuff. Um, and it was only when I actually started to speak about things that, you know, were, were affecting my mental health that other men were like, I've been through that. And then they'd speak to me about it. But if I hadn't gone to them and said, this is, you know, affecting me or sorry, I was grouchy the other day. I didn't mean to be, I'm going through a tough time because of blah, 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 blah then you just wouldn't have a clue that that was going on in people's lives. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, certainly. So talk to me a little bit about sort of your beginnings when things sort of came to a head for you. What were you talking about? Just the separation or is it something that happened? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk too much about my, my own personal case. Yeah. Um, but basically, I, had, I wasn't married, uh, had a child, went through family court, took three years, yeah. uh, had two years where I didn't see my little boy at all and um you know um that's really as much as i want to go into it and i want to talk about any allegations or anything because obviously uh, you know my little boy is important i don't want to uh implicate that any further but basically my background is in um, psychology and education so i've got a psychology degree um uh, i'm a teacher i've also worked in social care so for for me to go down the roots of family courts is a real eye opener because I've been on the other side quite a lot. I've been a foster brother, you know, when I was growing up, I'd seen, seen it from the other side and then I saw it from within. So it was quite eye opening to be honest. So you're launched into this area around separating parenting and co-parenting because of that has been quite a task for you. Well, what sort of hurdles generally come up for men going through separation that you've kind of recognized? Well, what what I I recognise in general, obviously, I've spoken to a lot of men about this, is, but not just men, women as well. Yeah. And um, you know, the law is not sexist. However, the implication, the implementation of it, is definitely sexist. Um, And there's a lot of that is to do with um, the way society sees men and fathers and sees sees women and mothers. Um, But what I what I've gathered is basically whoever is the resident parent from the start of proceedings basically holds a trump card. Yeah. So that could be the man. Sometimes that is the man in probably about just under 10% of cases. And then it becomes the woman then having to fight to get access to the child again. And the way that the court, the way that the law's written in practice direction 12J is, is basically, is basically to put that resident parent as the main parent and and they're the status quo so they're considered automatically the safe parent so we'll keep the child with that parent and then the other parent then has to fight through the courts to get whatever tiny bits of access they possibly can on top of that you then have the stigma of men domestic abuse blah 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 so from what i gather is that if the resident parent is the, the father from the start proceedings that 
the, the, the difficulties that the mother would have as a non-resident parent would be um, mental health problems or, um, you know, uh, possible substance abuse. These are the kind of things that would stop the mother getting contact. And they only have to be allegations. They don't even have to be found at all because to get to a fact finding can take a year and a half, you know. And that's a year and a half of not seeing your kid. Um, on the flip side, if you're the non-resident parent and you're the father, it's domestic abuse, it's sexual abuse, in in some cases, uh, accusations of child abuse. They get thrown at you. Also, there's there's mental health as well. Um, but it's interesting that you see really the mental health used against mothers when they're non-resident parents a lot more than it is fathers. It's much more down the domestic abuse route. So that's what that's what you found. Well, that's what I found from 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 my work, mm. from my work and 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 talk, talking to people, yeah, and supporting other people. Because I've worked I work with families need fathers quite a lot. I set up um, positive conclusions with a uh, a friend of, of mine now, and um, also we work with the Family Court Reform Coalition. Um, so yeah, I've, I've worked with quite a few people that are in the know. Uh, lots of them are females as well. So. And that's really interesting. So through your own experience, but also those people you've met, you've come to know that there is a distinct bias or a way of thinking before the courts even started, before the, the FEDRA almost, that, you know, they're looking yeah, there's what, a bias. have an idea of what's going to happen or what we, we should be doing. Well, there's a definite legal bias towards the, towards the resident parent and against the non-resident parent from the start. Um, and then there's obviously a societal bias as well because everything in the news you see is highlighting violence against women and girls and you never really see anything about violence against men and boys. Mm. Um, but, you know, in domestic abuse, I think it was a quarter or a third of all domestic abuses against males. Yeah. So how come you never hear about that? You only hear about the ter terrible cases in the news uh, 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 that's happening to women. Like the, the current case of, of, you know, it's not even domestic abuse, but the, the current case of Nic Nicola Bully, who's gone missing. Yeah. It's a terrible, terrible case. But there's like 170,000 people go missing in this country yeah. every year. Yeah. This case is getting loads of, loads of media attention, yet one in 10 children that have gone into care go missing at some point. Right. One in 10. Yeah. And and the average is one in two hundred. That's so. Why isn't that talked about? Why isn't it talked about that the fact that you know, that foster care or, or yeah. you know child child care in this country isn't safe? Why isn't it? You know why is why are they forgetting about the two hundred refugees child child refugees that went missing? Yeah, they just brush that under the carpet as soon as another story comes along. So I do think there's a big. Um, a big push for this narrative yeah. in the media. Why do you feel that, that that where certain groups are just being ignored, but yet we're making quite a big hoo-ha about one particular woman on all the pages? I think it's kind of, it's, it's happened over time quite slowly, and it's got to a point where it, it no one really saw this kind of happening, because violence against women and girls is, is definitely a, an issue. But if you just keep going on about that and keep ignoring other issues, eventually it will get to a point where everyone is aware of that issue and then there's other big issues that just get brushed under the carpet and ignored. Yeah. So I think that's kind of the point that we've got to now. Okay. So your Twitter page, tell me about your your presence on Twitter. What's that to try and engineer? Ultimately, really, we, we want there to be reforms in, in the family court. Um, because that's the area that we see uh, most prejudiced against um, against men and non-resident parents as a whole. Yeah. But mostly children. It's children that are harmed from this. Um, and that the harm that's done to children is really significant. And what I really, really want for politicians to understand is that when you remove a child from a parent, it causes significant harm to the child. Hmm. It's, there's so much research out there to show it. It's obvious. If you remove a primary caregiver from a child, it's yeah. going to cause significant harm. 
Yeah. But they don't weigh that harm up against any other potential harms. Yeah. So, for instance, you could have a uh, you could have a dad that's um, accused of shouting and screaming at, at his ex partner with the child in the bedroom. They did it once in a ten year marriage, and they get found to be a fact because it actually happened. They did shout at them. Yeah. And then they lose contact with their child for two years and then they have to have contact in the contact centre and slowly build it up to maybe if they're if they're lucky every other weekend. Yeah. That damage that's done to the child by losing their father or their mother for that long period of time hmm. is way, way, way more significant than overhearing an argument once in a ten year period. Yeah, fully understand that. So for the listeners, can you kind of I suppose detail some of the impacts on children that's a really really good question and um, it's, it's quite a complicated answer because it depends on the age of the children it depends on the period of time that they've not had contact with the other parent it depends on how much animosity is there between the, the parents but let me answer it this way if a child um, has at least a minimum of 30 percent time with both parents then the likelihood is that they will achieve the same kind of outcome as the child that had two parents together in a single household. Whereas if you've got a single parent that's bringing up, especially single mothers, bringing up a child, and there could be there could be lots of reasons for this, but if you have a single mother that's bringing up a child, the chances of incarceration skyrocket. The chances of dropping out of school, they skyrocket. The chances of mental health problems, they skyrocket. Interestingly, biological effects happen to children as well. So when the father's no longer present, as a daughter goes through puberty, they have different biological changes as to a child that actually has contact with their father or a paternal figure. Mm. There's, psycho- there's biological differences to, pe- to the actual adults as well. So you know, when, when a, a father has time with their child, they um they have different hormones in their bodies they become calmer you yeah. know because of these hormones if you take that away from them are you making society safer i don't think so no i mean so it's not just psychological it's biological and physiological um it's it, it's really massive massively important yeah so yeah i was just talking about dr linda nielsen Okay. Did you get that bit? No, no yeah. you didn't mention Dr. Linda Nielsen, but that's that's what. Just backtrack on that. Yeah, so she's got like, she's done a lot of research, and she's um, she's got uh, compiled like over sixty peer-reviewed studies into shared parenting, and right. that's where that thirty percent came from. But uh, basically, it all of the research points to co-parenting is is good for kids. Yeah. Um, and it reduces reduces um, all sorts of social, social, economical problems for children when they're growing up. Yeah, yeah. Which we so if we speak into um, a parent who's in the midst of or about to leave a family or you know they're yeah. about to separate, what sort of things do they kind of need to bear in mind? Do you think? Um, the f- first thing you need to bear in mind, if you're male or female, if you're or male, both. male. Okay, if you're male, the first thing you need to consider is if you're thinking about leaving the family home to keep safe or you've had enough of your partner and you would have just split up and have your own space, that will have severe implications if you end up going to court because you will then be considered leaving the family home yeah. and therefore leaving the children and you're automatically the non-resident parent at that point. So let's say you were, for example, a victim of domestic abuse uh, and your partner has been very abusive to you and you, you're you advised by mental health charities to escape the abuse, just bear it in mind that if you escape without your children, then your children will, will then be res- with the resident mother and that will put you on the back foot when you try and get contact with them if the resident parent who's the mother decides to not let you have contact and forces you through family court. So... I would suggest anyone that's going through a breakup or a separation that, first of all, they try to communicate with their ex-partner and you try to mediate. Mediation is key. But you 
really don't want to be mediating through solicitors if possible because solicitors have got you know an ulterior motive haven't they they want you to go to court really that's where they get most of their money from but there are like therapeutic mediation services out there for families so i think that's really what you should be looking at if you're at that point where you know you you need to separate from your partner but you have children before you do anything you need to get into mediation and create a plan but i'm always quite interested to see what what will be a successful kind of mediation outcome well that depends depends on like if the if the mother's at home and she doesn't work and you go to work then you need to then as the sensible parent agree that you're probably not going to have as much contact with the mother because she's got more time at home if that makes sense so there needs to be compromise there if you're both full-time full-time workers you know then why should one of you be getting way more contact than the other yeah you also need to be thinking about actually the positives of being able to have time when you don't have the kids so you can get other stuff done so you know just to try to um sell that point a little bit um also finances is a big thing so if you before you've gone to court if you've already decided you're going to separate you need to work out what's going to go on with your finances you need to come to an agreement because if you don't come to an agreement it's going to get messy you're going to family court both parties will miss out on a lot of money because loads of it will go to lawyers so it's a good idea if you're at this point to think about hold on what are we going to do financially? We've got a child here in the middle. So, for example, if one of you is working and the other one's not working, how are you going to support financially? You know, can you come to an agreement with child? You know, there's child maintenance, but can you come to an agreement without going through child maintenance? Because if you can come to an agreement where you're paying your ex-partner to raise your child and you're comfortable with that amount of money, and it's more than child maintenance would pay, make you pay, then in a way, that gives you more to work with with your ex-partner rather than another agency coming in and making decisions for you. And no one likes other people to make decisions about your money. Yeah, I, I get that. Um, and so that well, this, this is this this is exactly the the issue that we've got in society because before you go to family court, the support should be there to help parents separate in an amicable way. But, and, and also, it's, it, it's not just family courts, it's also you know, public law cases as well. At the moment, it's got to a point where more and more things are considered unacceptable in the view of domestic abuse. Yeah. 50 years ago, if you shouted at your ex-partner, people would have just not even batted an eyelid. But now, there's so the threshold is, is so much lower that it means people are going to, you know, take serious action really quickly yeah yeah? so this is this is a double-edged sword because that means more and more children are getting taken taken into care but also more and more accusations can be thrown around because you know anything can be considered domestic abuse now so you really want to avoid that so the best way to avoid it would and and the cheapest way for the country would be to put into place support for families that are struggling you know is there mental health support is there free mediation not just a 500 pound mediation voucher free mediation therapeutic mediation is there you know counseling there available is there support for the children to to manage you know is there therapy for them if you put all of this support into place i guarantee you it would be far far cheaper than the current system which is either take children into care and foster them long-term foster care or forcing parents through family court and having to have backlogs of, of of cases and having family um sorry legal aid and all that costs costs millions and millions and millions of pounds a year. For, Not to mention the the cost the long term cost on on society and the economy. So we're we're not even considering the cost of policing and 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 that. All the work really should be done before we even get to court because I. I am always amazed that when I have to support a dad going through court, how 
little conversation has happened about really what the ending is and it's all battled out in the courtroom and accusations from paper paper will go from solicitor to solicitor and barrister and to barrister yeah. and, that kind of stuff. and it's just it's such a waste of court's time energy but also emotionally for both parents it's quite sad because organizing this sort of thing can be done at a cost of coffee i think you'd be three coffees yeah. down before you could before you haven't sorted and, 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 and the crazy thing is yeah you could spend three years battling out in court you get to a final hearing and what's your final hearing your final hearing is literally just what you just mentioned just two two sides coming together making an agreement yeah. obviously it's after loads of mud being slung and you know you've got probably got one person that's in the box seat and then the other person is trying to get as much. But ultimately, you get to the final hearing, and the judge just wants you two both to agree. Yeah. So they don't have to agree themselves. So why can't you do that in mediation? Why have you got to go through three years of hell, you know, slinging mud at each other and paying solicitors and barristers tens of thousands of pounds to get yeah. to the same point you could have got to three years ago just in a cost of coffee? But then sometimes somebody has to kind of take the initiative to sort of wind the animosity down. That's a really good point too, because I, I even think even maybe in my case that if I just left it, you know, if I if I'd not um risen risen to um my partner who told me to go to family court then I just filed straight away for family court because I thought she told me to. If I just left left it for six months or so, maybe things would have been completely different, you know. But then as soon as you make that application, you can't undo it. No. You can't it's really difficult to back back out of it. And even when you're in, in, in um proceedings, they discourage mediation, which I find really crazy. They're like, Oh no, you can't mediate now. Now you're already in. They're like Kafka, discourage me from mediation. Why? I even said said to them like could, could I, you know, would I be able to contact my ex partner to mediate at this point? And they don't they didn't want us to. It's really tricky because you know you'll have you'll have dads here listening, and they'll be like, "I can't wait two years without seeing my kids." So if I wait for six months, six months before just to see if if things calm down, it's an extra six months. So it's yeah. getting to three years without seeing your kids. It's a really tricky, and and one of the biggest problems is how long it's court takes. Yeah. So my my advice would would be don't apply to court if you can possibly avoid it. If you're having any contact with your kids. Yeah don't apply to court it even if it's way less than you want it might be like one saturday every two weeks and you might only be for a few hours yeah but that is worth holding on to and trying to build on rather than taking your ex-partner to court because the first thing that will happen is you'll lose that saturday yeah and i must and then you're going to be going then you're going to be trying to build it from zero so at least if you're trying to build it from that saturday uh, and just keep being nice to your ex-partner no matter how difficult it is when I work with dads, that's pretty much why I advocate is, is look, you've got to look at it from the kid's point of view. You shouldn't say or do anything that you wouldn't do in front of them. And remember that you're talking to their mum. And when you start looking at it that way, you think, right, well, the fact that she did burn all my clothes, kick me out of the house. You yeah. kind of have to put that aside because of the great scheme of things. If she's not getting done for criminal damage, you kind of have to focus on it's just about contact with the kids. So what reason is there for you to not be able to see your children safely? You now have to clear your head, especially when you get shitty emails from the others, you know, from her solicitors saying you need to do this and blah, blah, blah. You're being controlling and abusive. And it becomes this tit for tat thing. that is just not part of what's necessary for children. And, mm. and that's what kind of really interests me. The fact that you're now focusing on sort of earlier down the chain, when it starts getting a bit rocky, what do you need to do to decouple as safely as possible for those involved? And I don't think anybody's really thought about that, to be honest. It's something that men especially need to, to really think about because if you do end up going through court and, and you end up having solicitors, I know from experience that, that you know that solicitors are going to be encouraging you to be thinking of what did your ex-partner do? throughout this relationship you might have had a 10 year relationship with somebody and they're trying to find one needle in a haystack that you can yeah. present to a judge as, a, as this massive problem now yeah. if your solicitor is trying to do that with you 
And what's your exes still doing? Yeah. You know, they're doing they're doing that for ten times worse because let's face it, violence against women and girls is much more um, prominent in 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 their minds yeah. than violence against men and, and boys. I mean, I've, you'll have um you'll have a judge sitting there. And they just will not believe that you, as a male, are bigger and 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 you know talk taller than your ex partner could possibly be uh, abused emotionally or physically abused. I mean, it, it's a nonsense because obviously we've been taught, you know, from our generation, we've been taught you never lay a hand on a, a woman. So if a woman's not been ever ever taught you never put her hand lay a hand on a man, then surely the chances are that women may physically assault men and men won't do anything about it because that's been ingrained in our, in our, our in our education from when we were younger. I, I don't know what it's like now. Now it's probably a bit, a bit less like that, but. Well, I think actually speaking to young people is actually more so because of the, if you say or behave in a way, the, the strap line of toxic masculinity rears its head and it's stamped on mm. literally, on literally every, any any action. Um, so for young men, not really knowing how to communicate their thoughts and feelings, or to actually be able to take be taken seriously when they say no to something. Yeah, but the interesting thing is that the, 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 the young men that end up doing these things, most of them have come from single mother households. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you you obviously would have the. You know, the psychology and social work background that you, you can kind of see that that would happen. But I've worked not with, all, obviously, yeah, but the majority. Yeah. So there's this, there is this issue around how we communicate and so on. But I think it's it's not just about how men and boys communicate. It's about how people listen to that voice when they do learn to communicate well, because or share their thoughts and feelings once they've identified what they are. Because mm. I I am finding often that men is especially are in a position where when they say I'm very sad about something or this makes me feel lonely, depressed or upset, um, people go, yeah, okay. And that's, that's it. Nobody, I post them. Mm. There's no wraparound support. A woman can walk into a one-stop shop. I mean, I think this is, this comes down from the believe, believe all women um, mantra, I guess. And I think the big issue with that is if you believe anything that any woman says, that means you have to believe that the man's done something, even without any evidence. I don't think that that's right. I think what we should do is that we should take every allegation seriously. It's a completely different way, yeah. uh, but it's no less harmful to women, but it also doesn't harm the men. Believe all women, it harms men because you can have false accusations in there and then they'll just be believed. And that's very, very frequent in, in family court because there's uh, benefits of making false accusations in the family court where those benefits would be wouldn't be present in the outside world you know but yeah. in a secret family court you can get legal aid you can get higher you know if you can stop your your uh, ex-partner seeing your child you can get more money through child maintenance um and you you're more likely to to win your case you know in quotation marks because no one really wins in family court especially the children that always lose. But, yeah, and that's, you know, cool. that's it, yeah. So the biggest casual casualty is always the children. I, I will mention one thing from my case. Is my, my, my little boy was very, very young when, when proceedings started. He wasn't even a year old. And uh, one of the things that the judge said is he's too young, it won't affect him. And that is so wrong. Yeah. Um, I mean, and then when you... One of the really, really frustrating things for me was coming from an education and a psychologist psychology background through you know learning about child development is i know that the judge is wrong but you can't say anything no. i'm more qualified than the, the kafka i was more qualified than kafka more qualified than the social worker more qualified than the judge more qualified than any of the solicitors on child development yet they wouldn't listen to me they made their own mind up and they were like it wouldn't affect your child in fact actually the first three years of a child's life are the most important in their development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when their brain is rapidly growing, you yeah. know. So to remove one of their caregivers in that time is dramatic to that child. Yeah. But yeah. just to turn around as a judge and say, no, they're too young, they won't remember it. They might not remember it, but it has deep 
deep scars on their brain. Yeah. They won't even know why. In fact, it could be even more damaging because they won't know why they've got the problems when they're older because they can't remember it. So you, go... you grow up and you have attachment issues and you struggle with relationships and you don't know why. Yeah. Well, maybe that was because you didn't have one of your parents for three years. Yeah, yeah. So it goes all the way back to everyone needs to have some kind of therapeutic intervention for everybody before even going yeah, to I think mediation. So, but... Yeah, I think so. But also, like, there's, there's loads of outside family courts and outside separation. There's loads of children that are growing up in single-parent households, and it's nothing to do with the separation. It might be, um, you know, single mothers by choice, or it could be because one of the parents doesn't want a relationship with their child. They also need support because they're growing yeah. up without a, one of their parents. Yeah. So, you know, that what support is there for them? Have they got a granddad that's helping or uncles and stuff? So I think it's important for for all single parents to understand that. The more parents or adult figures that are around the child, the more beneficial emotionally or psychologically for the child. Yeah, obviously positive adult role models. <laughs> yeah. Children need to know that they're, they're loved and they need to know how to love themselves. And I think the current uh, system is stopping that from happening. So with your, your work through Twitter, what sort of services are on offer? What sort of things do you do when people contact you? Or what are you hoping to do? Well, at the moment, like what I, I'm hoping to do is through the Family Court Reform Coalition is to get as many organisations as possible to write down their reasons for why family court needs to be reformed. Not how it's reformed. We've got our own proposals that other people have their proposals. Uh, yeah. You know, as positive conclusions, we've got our proposals that we've also also worked alongside Family Court Reform Coalition to create a different set of proposals. We are not seeking people to uh, agree to our proposals because everyone's got their own ideas and it would be much more difficult to get everyone to agree to one set of proposals. Yeah. What we need to do is get uh, as many reasons for why the family court system is broken and why it needs to be reformed as possible and get all of those people to write their reasons, have one document and have that present to the politicians to say, look, family court needs to be reformed our coalition is here. All of these groups are in the coalition, and these are all of our reasons. That's our goal from the Family Court Reform Coalition point of view. The positive conclu conclusions, which is the one I, I run with, with Tim. Tim runs the website. Um, that's more um, more to do with raising awareness, um, presenting solutions, possibly, and also challenging people. So we challenge uh, challenge views quite often. Um, there's some, obviously, like Andrew Tate at the moment, quite quite um, in in the media. I'm not sure if you've realised, but he's he's all over the place. In like yeah. the schools are, are are trying to fight against his ideologies, and I really don't like Andrew Tate whatsoever. Um, I think that he's a quite quite horrible man, to be honest. But um, he resonates with some young men. However, there's a barrister called Dr. Charlotte Proudman, and she's literally <laughs> the identical identical thing as he is but she's a barrister yeah but she spurts exactly the same thing but from a feminist ideology you know so how come it's absolutely fine for her to be going around and and and, and spurting sexist nonsense and, and you know, she's a successful barrister in the family court which sh shows a lot because she's so so sexist against men yeah but she's successful in family court so how many innocent men has she stopped from, from seeing their kids? It, 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 it terrifies me, to be honest. So why are we allowing prejudice against males? It's harmful to society to, to judge, prejudge people and to, to come up with solutions based on people's protected traits. It's just harmful to society, in my view. I think even if, like, if, let's, if, we, go, if we go with statistics, let me just turn my light on. If we go with statistics, yeah, which suggests that, um, I, I can't remember if it was a third of, of domestic abuse um, victims are male. I think it was a third or a quarter. Yeah. Yeah. If we go with these statistics, which doesn't consider the fact that males are less likely to report it. So if we say a quarter of them are male and three quarters are female, are we just ignoring a quarter of the, the, the victims of domestic abuse? Yeah. Because currently we are. Yeah. It's, it's over 700,000 people you're ignoring it doesn't make any sense because yeah. all, all of the laws that you can put in place and all of the strategies you can put into place you can do it gender neutral it is wrong to be to sexually abuse people it is wrong 
to harass people. It is wrong to do all of these things. So why only target boys? But the truth is, it couldn't be further from from the truth. There's research out there that shows that um, that non-reactive abuse females are more likely to be perpetrators. Reactive abuse is more 50-50. Males are, are genetically generally bigger and stronger. If two if people get into a fight, one's male, one's female, it's probably that the female is going to end up more seriously injured or, or harmed, which is terrible. And we need to stop these kind of things. But you're ignoring the fact that that's react. Most of that is reactive abuse. Yeah. So they're reacting to another piece of abuse. So we're ignoring female abuse completely and only concentrating on male abuse. If you tackle both, you'd help society because she would, he would be le- less likely to, to react because there wouldn't be the abuse to react to. But also, if he did have to react, you'd be supporting that because you'd be teaching them how to manage yeah. and how to avoid getting into those states. You have to tackle all forms of abuse and not just say men are the problem. One, one of the things I was listening to on, on uh, the radio this morning was on Five Live, um, and they were talking about domestic abuse. And um, one of the arguments, a very strong argument, is that uh, you should never blame women for the abuse that they suffer. The way to deal with it is to teach men not to attack and not to rape and not to do. The problem here with this argument, though, yeah. is it doesn't matter how much we teach people. There'll still be one crazy person out there and there'll be one dangerous person out there. You know, it won't be your your son, it won't be my son, but there'll be somebody out there and they will be dangerous. You don't need to just teach men and young boys to not be abusive. You also need to teach, you need to teach everybody not to be abusive, but you also need to teach everybody how to keep safe. What What is abuse? What, what do you do when you see these things happen? And all of these skills are not being taught at the moment. And that's why we've got so many problems. So what sort of help could they get? Yeah, they can c- contact me on on, um, on my Twitter page. It's P, at P Conclusions. My TikTok page actually has got quite a few followers on there, but uh, a lot of them are from America. You can contact me directly through Twitter or through um, the TikTok page. And also we've got a website as well. And uh, you can contact us through the, the website and I'll, I'll get those emails through. So I'm happy happy to support anyone um i also i also um support people through families need fathers quite a lot yeah um i'm not a mckenzie friend as such uh, I, I wouldn't go to court to support people but i do help people with either finding decent mckenzie friends or sometimes i just help people to to fill in forms and stuff my viewpoint is that uh, i don't think anybody should make any profit from from family breakdown, especially when children are involved. So I never ever charge anybody for for any help I, I give them. But if I'm unable to help and I suggest somebody else, they probably would charge. Yeah, because you've got to get to court and it's a whole day usually, isn't it? So, I mean, yeah, if there's it's... not that many people that can afford to do it for free. I think sometimes separated parents are in such a vulnerable situation because they're almost full of guilt, upset, disappointment, shame, whatever it is that they, uh, they well, become so vulnerable to this financial attack almost. What I'd suggest to anyone that's listening is if they are going through a breakdown is to contact, you can talk, contact you or contact me. or, or uh, And then I th- the first thing I'd do is have a chat to you about your situation because you need to work out whether you do need to fill in a C100 or not. Yeah. Because um, that's the first bit of us. Because I'd be very, very hesitant about ever filling a C100 because going to, through family court is the, basically it's going to be the worst thing you've ever done. So you have to be 100% sure it's the right thing. And too many people end up going to family court when they probably could have avoided it. Thank you for listening to this episode. I'm really getting a big kick out of producing these episodes for you. And I hope you find them useful. I would really appreciate if you could subscribe and automatically download future episodes the moment they're released. If you want to get in touch with me, then that's great because all communication comes straight to me and everything you share is confidential and important. So, tell everybody about it and thanks again and be good to yourself. Remember, you're important.